We are thrilled to have you here today with us for our workshop. As you join, please put your name in the chat um, and share where you're joining from, what district or institution or organization you are joining with. We are thrilled to have you here. We will just start in a moment, but for the time being, if you could introduce yourself in the chat, we would love to know who's with us today. Hey, welcome, Clarence. It's great to see you coming from Georgia. My name is Kim Way. I am coming from North Carolina, um, and I am our professional manager um, of uh, at Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity. As you join, we'd love to know who you are and where you're joining from. Um, so if you can share in the chat your name and where you're joining us from, we would love to know who's with us today. Welcome Beatrice from Albany, New York. I used to live in Syracuse, so it's great to make those upstate New York, New York connections. Thanks for coming today. We're excited to have you all here. We'll get started in just one moment as folks join. If you can just introduce yourself in the chat, we are thrilled to have you with us today. Welcome, welcome. It's great to see everyone joining us here today. If you can um, introduce yourself in the chat with your name and where you're joining with the, um, joining from today, we would love to know who's with us. We are going to get started, but don't worry, this is being recorded. Um, so we will be sharing a follow-up um, if you're coming in a little late uh, with the recording. Um, welcome. Uh, let's dig in. Um, I want to share a little bit about Branch Alliance before we get into the content of the workshop for those who are new with us today or have joined other events of ours. Um, just a little bit about Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity, or we like to call ourselves Branch Ed. We are a professional services organization and a collective of university faculty and leaders advancing educational equity and excellence by expanding individual capacity, enabling supportive relationships, boosting institutional effectiveness, and collaborating with communities. BranchEd's commitment is to achieve sustainable programmatic transformation, leading to improved outcomes for diverse educators who, by extension, benefit all students by preparing them to thrive in our heterogeneous society. We are thrilled to have everyone here. I'm so glad that you've chosen to spend part of your day with us. You will have an opportunity a little later on to get to know each other better through large group and small group discussion. But for now, please be sure to have your institutional name, um, your name and your institution on your Zoom box. You can do that by clicking on your name and then clicking on the rename. Button. My name is Kim Igwe, and I am our professional development manager here at Branch Ed, um, and will be one of our facilitators for today's workshop. We are all joining from different spaces. Some of us are joining from home offices, and some of us are joining from work buildings. A couple things to keep in mind for today's workshop. We are recording, as I mentioned, and we will send it in a follow-up email. Um, resources will be shared in the chat feature. Um, use the chat feature if you need any help, technical help. Um, Jennifer Reese um, is here with us today from Branch Ed and she will be helping us on the back end, coming on and off video as needed, but she will always be there if you have any tech issues. Thank you, Jennifer, in advance for helping us out there. Um, if you have ideas, questions, please feel free to connect via the chat. Just know as facilitators, we're really focused on sharing that content, so we might not always be able to share um, your, if you have questions automatically, but we will get to them. Um, please be on camera as much as, as possible um, if you're able to. It just helps us to create a community during these virtual workshops. Branch Ed offers a variety of professional learning experiences and resources for individuals, institutions, and community members. Through each of these professional learning experiences, our beliefs always hold true. 
that every student deserves access to caring, adaptive, and well-prepared teachers, that every teacher deserves preparation that fuses quality with diversity, and that every person benefits when we create a higher standard of education together. I would now like to hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Luzoma Canales, our Vice President for Community Engagement and Partnerships. She led our first Linguistic Diversity Joint Action Group, which is um, how this workshop series came to be. Luzoma, thanks for being with us today and sharing more about the Linguistic Diversity Joint Action Group. It's good to see everyone. I see some familiar faces and then I see some faces I've not seen before. So welcome everyone. Um, so Branch Ed creates spaces where we bring faculty leaders, scholars, and, and others where we, we, in something we call joint action groups or JAGs. Uh, our joint action groups bring together subject matter experts to address needs within our core community. Um, rather than working in isolation, we believe strongly that that it is important for us to, to build these spaces where folks come together to kind of address some, some pressing needs. JAGs for us have proven to be, to be a very effective tool for working collaboratively uh, with our core community across institutions to develop resources, tools, and to build learning opportunities for, for each other. And so the branch head work occurred in, in two phases. So in phase one, during academic year 2021, um, Branch Ed formed a joint action group from, comprised of 11 faculty, MSI faculty, um, whose research and practice centered around linguistic diversity. And as you might imagine, that was very varied, right? Depending on, on, the, on the field and the lens that people work from. So the linguistic diversity um, phase one, Jack, focused on the vital role of language and learning. The aim of phase one was to create tools and resources for teacher educators that prepare teacher candidates to serve linguistically diverse PK-12 students. This group of 11 faculty created over 50 tools and resources that are now available in our resource portal. In phase two, during academic year 21-22, uh, we brought together six of the 11 faculty from phase one to develop high quality learning opportunities based on areas that our core community identified as needs in the, in the field of teaching preparation. This group of six faculty developed two online modules and four workshops for the Linguistic Diversity um, Workshop Series. Um, we're really proud to introduce the fourth and final uh, of these workshop series uh, with um, that, that this group developed, as you can see on the on the on the screen this spring, we ha and we had one in February, two in March, and this is our final one. Um, can we? And it's on centering art to question the world around us. And y'all, I had the pleasure to with work to work with Dr. Faltis over two years. He, I'm in deep South Texas in McAllen, Texas. He's in Laredo, uh, north northwest of me, about a, a hundred and some miles. Uh, but it, it has been a pleasure to, to work with him. And when I saw the work that he did, I'm like, you have got to be a part of this workshop series because it's, it's super important. So Dr. Christian Faltis is a current professor of bilingual education at Texas A&M International University in Laredo, Texas, right? In South Texas, along the, the Rio, the, the Mexico-Texas uh, border. He was the Dolly and David Fittiment Chair in teacher education, director of uh, teacher education and professor of language, uh, literacy and culture at the University of California, Davis from 2008 to 2016. And a chair and professor of teaching and learning in the College of Vet and Human Ecology at Ohio State University from 2016 to 2020. Christian was a Fulbright scholar in Honduras and in 2001. He was the recipient of the ERA Distinguished Scholar Award. He was named as ERA Fellow in 2016. He has been editor of TESOL, of the TESOL uh, Journal and Texas Education Quarterly. He holds a master's and a PhD in curriculum and teacher education with an emphasis in bilingual cross-cultural education from Stanford University. 
He has published more than 100 pieces since the 1970s, including 23 books on language diversity and bilingual education. And with that, I leave you with Dr. Faltes to enjoy this journey that will go on on centering art to question the world around us. Christian? Uh, you're still muted, Christian. Thank you, everybody, for showing up to this, and I, I'll, I'll work on my muting and unmuting. Um, you know, uh, this is going to be uh, an opportunity to talk about um, uh, centering art um, in in all of our lives, and particularly in, in the field of teacher education and working with teachers, and, and if teachers are involved. and And I think it's really important because art art education is one of the areas that has has been downplayed as as um, a, a assessment and, and teaching and all these things uh, uh, are, are, are being um, uh, increasingly used in schools and so we don't see a lot of art. Um, so we'd like to just start this out by just uh, maybe sharing your experience. Uh, think about you know, how, how you use art in your classes in, uh, in, and how you, if you work with teacher educators, if you work with teachers, if you're a teacher yourself, um, uh, maybe share your experience of how you use art to support your learning objectives and to engage students in critical thinking. Uh, and you can just uh, maybe think about that for a minute or so and then uh, share it in the chat. And then that way we'll be able to uh, get this thing going. So I'll just give you a minute here and uh, we'll keep going. And for those of you, I'm, I'm sure most of you know, but you can go down to the bottom of your screen and it says chat and then you can, uh, oh good, you began to emphasize steam. That's great. Oh, great. That's really great, Clarence. Pixel, hmm, great. Pixel art, nice. Yeah, we're going to do some of those feelings and ideas. That's great, Anita. Yeah. Wonderful. Visualize learning journals. Hmm, that's interesting. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about that, Christine. I, I'm not sure of that. Uh, that's a central, very, very good tool to use. All right, here we are as we as we go through, and I, I did I hope to get ideas. Oh, Beatriz, you'll get lots of ideas here. So you know, uh, to start out, the way I, that I envision art, and I've been an artist now, you know, all my life, but you know, really uh, concentrated my efforts for the past eighteen years on art, and you'll see that my art uh, addresses certain kinds of topics in society, and each one of you will have topics and areas that that are really concerning to you and, you know, part of your, your own a set of experience. And that's what you need to tap into. And, you know, I'm looking out my window right now and talking to you and I can see art out there. There are trees everywhere and, and parallel, uh, you know, I can see lines of these palm trees and stuff. Um, you know, I think about here, we've got um, uh, volcanoes and children like to build volcanoes and uh, think about volcanoes and, you know, where are some of the biggest volcanoes in the world? And where is, you know, why does Hawaii have a big volcano? What does it look like? What's that stuff coming out at the top? We can talk about in Mexico, we have Popocatepetl, which is one of the, the, the largest active volcanoes that smokes all the time. And it's such a beautiful thing. And Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. So there, there are, these are, uh, these are things that kids can begin. You can see that these are triangles with a little bit of uh, um, uh, idea to get the, the heat using red warm colors and then you've got the mountains with the darker colors and the blues to get the cool colors. So right, right away with you see with these very, very young drawings that, uh, that children are already seeing how certain colors are warm and other colors are cool and that's something that you can um, 
use as to teach students how to use colors um, to uh, represent uh, warmness and coolness and, and things like that. And so we have these, these first two examples here and um, you could easily see how kids could um, do those. Here's a, here's a piece that I did using a, um, a volcano in the background of this, uh, uh, this mariachi here playing uh, guitar with the Virgen. Um, sort of looking for hope. That, that's the expression I have. But, you know, you can think about all these things. A lot of people ask me in this one, well, why did you put a volcano in the back? And that's because, you know, I wanted to get that sense of volcano erupting, that things are moving and that there's, uh, that there's, there's violence in the background at the same time um, that uh, that you know a, a, a person is playing music and i know like uh, marlene says she can see popocatepetl every day and um uh you know and i know that it smokes and sometimes that it even goes off and so <clears throat> it's really really important to you know this is a way of of, of using art to to actually express uh, something uh in a, in a painting like this and so that's what i was trying to do and using the red as a very warm color uh, along with the, the greens, which are a little bit cooler, and then having the blue sky and the red in there. So I tried to coordinate those things. And you can talk about all those things uh, with students, uh, you know, as you put art around your room, because all teachers have art and they bring art and they show videos and they show these things. So it's really, really important. And I use a lot of the Virgen de Guadalupe in my paintings because it's part of my historical self and and my life and and things like that and, and you'll notice it here that I have the Virgin also holding a big uh, sort of bio, violin and uh, 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 or a, a, a guitar there so that the idea of music and music is a way of expressing um, uh, feelings and things like that and this the, the look on the guy's face I have it as kind of solemn because of the, because of the volcano that's that's exploding in the background and there's also if you notice, in the middle of that, there's above those red mountains. There's a little town there uh, that that may may get some of those uh, that volcano there. And I don't know if that's Popocatépetl, uh, as uh, uh, Marlene pointed out, that 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 could happen. But sometimes smoke and some ashes and 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 you know those kinds of things, rocks, uh, th those can come down. Um, so that that is something that's that's dangerous. Okay. It's active, yes. Oh, there's uh, Luis. It is very active, and the local international airport is closed thanks to all the ash. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah, that's that's amazing. So you can see that a volcano. Uh, a lot of our kids may not know down here in Laredo may not know about a volcano, but we can show the ones in Popocatépetl. We can show the one up over in Hawaii. And we can show other ones and, and what they are, and and I think kids really enjoy that. Um, here's an example of clouds, and um, I, I know that uh, um, uh, clouds, you know, um, happen, you know, there's something that we can see every day outside, and I love to look at clouds around here in Laredo. We have these beautiful, just giant cumulus clouds that, that are so beautiful, and, and yet they're really hard to, to uh, capture in art because there are so many different kinds of clouds. And here you see the cloud and on the left hand side with the boat there, uh, you see that the, the whoever the artist is um, put a little bit of tone in there, uh, a little gray tone uh, to give that sense that at the bottom of the cloud, uh, there's going to be it's going to be heavier. And then you have on the right hand corner, uh, some kids use uh, cotton and then uh, uh, drops of water to get that um, uh, that uh, uh, cycle that happens where clouds hold the water and then produce rain for us. And then we have the little uh, young man there drawing a cloud with the, with the, the sun because the sun, um, the, the, the clouds are reflecting the light of the sun and that's why they're so light in the air, which is blue. And then down on the right hand corner, you know that sometimes you have a cloud over your head that means you're kind of worried. Uh, you could be maybe depressed or uh, something's not going right for you, and that's a way of indicating um, that something's going on in your life. And and art can do that rather than just uh, you know writing that out. Um, you can capture those deep feelings um, that, that that students can have. Um, and uh, look at how happy the kid is in the middle there that he drew that happy face with the sun. 
and and got some idea about you notice that the dark around the bottom of the clouds in there and then put some white in there so what he's doing is toning down that cloud so it gives it a little bit of of depth um and that and that's something that you know he's probably been taught and and the talk about you know when you talk about color and color ideas about how white and and black um uh, go along a a system to make a, a grays and those grays then uh, can give you uh, certain kinds of, of <clears throat> tones, um, and, and you can have mid-level tones and uh, hot, lighter tones on, like on the the the, uh, the cloud there, and then make them really dark at the bottom, and that indicates that there's likely to be rain coming from those. Right. Oh, and here's the the next one is I I, I love this drawing here. I put these up because. You can see that how complex this is, uh, the you know, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and collection of water. Those are all big words. They're, they're nouns uh, that are taken from verbs. They're nominal, nominalization of verbs of, to evaporate, evaporation, condense, con condensation, to precipitate, and to pre precipitation, to collect and collection. So these are very good vocabulary words. And um, to have students um, uh, get an opportunity to draw out and understand that, and it's, it's hard to understand why we get rain and what a rain cloud looks like, and uh, when, 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 how is it that that the water that's on the ground goes up uh, and and is uh, collected in there, it evaporates and it's collected, and then over time, under the right conditions. Uh, it will rain, which we call uh, precipitation, and then it will collect again and continue that cycle. And so this is a way of getting at a complex uh, science idea and have kids uh, draw it and, and paint it. And you can see that these, these students here are using um, uh, pretty, pretty uh, cool colors here on the mountains in the water and then lighter colors uh, up there. Notice on the one on the right, again, they've got the darker clouds over there with condensation and then the sun is lighting those clouds up and so that's a good rendition of what what happens um, as things evaporate and then condensate and then come down and then go back around again and that that helps them rather than just reading about it or having the teacher saying it or looking at a quick video if you can have students actually show and apply their knowledge um, and then be able to talk about it by pointing at the things that they're doing. This is a set especially helpful for English learners because they've got the words there and they've got the support uh, to scaffold uh, their discussion of this particular process. So I, I thought that was a, a, a really good way of showing it. And here's a couple of paintings that I did where, where, there, <laughs> where I put clouds in the background. So, you know, there, there are maybe six or seven different kinds of clouds and uh, you know, this is not something that young kids would do, but certainly by second or third grade, they 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 learn about cirrus clouds and cumulus crowd, uh, clouds. And, uh, you know, and uh, here I am, I'm floating around. This is me at the beginning of the pandemic, floating around in the cumulus clouds that are relatively low in, in the sky, just uh, enjoying the day. And then here we have uh, on this mountain, we have these uh, cirrus clouds, which are much higher clouds and they're going to go uh, in, in a direction that, you know, sort of like this. They're moving. Uh, they're, they tend to be up higher and they don't, they're not, uh, uh, they don't accumulate like cumulus clouds do. And so, and they're very, clouds are very, very hard to draw and paint uh, to do them well. And so you can give students opportunities to do that because what it does is it introduces things like tones, different tones and different shades. Uh, so you can uh, teach them about different, very, very uh, fundamental ideas and color theory, and, and that will help them develop their understanding of how color works and, and those kinds of things. All right, so for the uh, first thing we're going to do today, and this is going to be uh, kind of fun, um, is that we're going to have each of you draw um, a scorpion. So um, I, we'll put you into groups and things like that. And you say, oh, I can't draw. Or what about what about a drawing? Or you maybe you won't say that, but um, uh, your children will say that or your students will say that. Well, I don't draw, profe, I don't do this. Um, 
But you know, you what you want to do with art is encourage the students to explore and to be creative. And you know, we were talking about this recently. You know, and sort of Bloom's taxonomy is that your creativity is at the top, and I sort of really push back on that. That we can have young children. Um, somebody was just telling me a story about how children created their own insects um, and then got up and talked about them at three years old. And so, um, you know, it's that's the creative aspect of, of what art can do for children. It pushes them to think about things that they wouldn't have thought about, um, you know, just by somebody teaching them or by seeing things because they're they're creating all over the place. And, and one of the things I like to do is, is work with scorpions because a lot of people have a fear of scorpions and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're around us. They, they look kind of, you know, mean and they might have poison and things like that. But, you know, um, scorpions actually, um, you know, they've been around for over 400 million years and they're one of the most important uh, uh, insects or arachnids uh, that, that we have on earth. Uh, and some of them are very small like this, and some of them are very large like this. I had a pet Scorpy. I called him Scorpy for about three years or so. He was an, he was an emperor uh, scorpion, and he was very, very good uh, to me. And he helped me, uh, you know, you know uh, take care of him. And I, I would take him out, and I would put him in my hand, and I would cup him, and I would take him into second grade or third grade. And, uh, and, and show, um, it was just really, really fun to see that. So um, uh, I, I thought it, it's really good to, to have scorpions. So what I'd like you to do, there's a, the, on the next slide there um, is, is our two scorpions that we have. If we could put that slide up. Here it comes. Yeah, I want you to open your imagination. Uh, and and the, and the next slide, we'll talk, we'll, I'll show you these two scorpions. So the scorpion on the left is one that I found on my floor in Laredo. He was a nice little guy, and I made sure and took a piece of paper and took him outside. Now, do you, do you know what scorpions eat? Scorpions eat termites. And so they're, they're, it's really important. They eat termites, they eat uh, uh, grasshoppers, they eat wasps uh, and, and, and insects like that. So it, they're really important to have. And then the, the, the one next to it is a kind of the, the red scorpion. That's kind of like a, you know, uh, uh, you could make him into a, a really a special kind of a scorpion. This one's, a, you know, like that they have in, in the kids' games and things like that. So both of these scorpions I drew on... On, a, on an iPad or, or something like that, where I where I use uh, uh, colors. And what I'd like you to do as you uh, draw these scorpions in a, in a few minutes is to, first of all, on the one on the left, um, look at what you see in terms of, um, you know, uh, do you see circle squares? Do you see a number in 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 the scorpion's tail? Uh, right, right, uh, Dr. Greyhouse, you see a number nine, right? I stand nueve. Um, and so that's that's number nine there. And you can t you, you also could see two C's, and the, the others are there, and you've got a nice oval shape. And so also there are four legs and those kinds of things. So, uh, you could uh, try to work on that. That that one, this one was actually a little harder to draw than this one now. The second one, the red one, is uh, uh, it's it, it's got a little perspective on it, so it's turned sideways, but you can still see that it has kind of like an oval shape, and then it has the it doesn't have C's, but it has the, it has the the the, the pincers actually are are more visible uh, in that one, and then you have the tail coming up, and it's more like a C or almost like a person's head. And so you can draw that. So, um, you know, just take your time on those, uh, you know, get that eye in there. And uh, I think what, what's going to happen now, Jennifer will put you into some groups uh, um, and you get to draw those things and, and see what you come up with. And uh, we'll, we'll come back and, and have a look at those. And I ask you to hold up your papers here in a little bit. So we'll give you about five or five to seven minutes to do those. And I'm looking forward to those. Uh, Luisa, um, see how those go. 
Okay, here we go. I'm opening the brick oven. Okay. So they're in their rooms now? Yeah, uh, except for one okay. person, Michael. I'm going to okay. move. How many uh, participants we have? See, I think we have eight. Okay. Oh, and we just lost a few people, didn't we? Okay, Nathan. Okay, that's good. I understand. Thank you, Nathan. So they're able to see the see the two scorpions, right? The draw. They. Let me see if I can get these images in the chat. I can. Let me see if I can get it to them. Okay. And drawing some <laughs> let me see oh wait what is it's just, uh, all i have is a pencil oh i can't really see it i don't know how to do this but, but anyway you put it in front of your face it doesn't look like it looks more like um breakfast food oh. so i started drawing bowls of cereal <laughs> that's, that's art <laughs> that's art that's art absolutely I'm going to pop over to the other room to give them the um, the drawings. Yeah, good idea. Hi, Lisa. Hey, there's Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hey, sorry, I'm a little late. That's no, all right. We're no just way. drawing scorpions right now. So if you, uh, you, you, they're going to put you in a in a chat room and you can draw some scorpions. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. Here you go. I'm going to put you in room two. I think. Okay. I think they have the scorpions. Do you know Lisa, Dr. Mitchell? Nope. She participates in almost everything. Oh, she does? That oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah, she's. Yeah. I have two. I see the two of my friends from member. Mexico or uh, way down in Puebla are, are participating today. So that's great, too. I love that. I saw in there. Um, we did have one other international person, but she might have dropped off. Maiko. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I saw that when I was checking how many registrations, you know, over the last days and yeah. weeks. Well, that's good. It looks like you were able to. It was just a good mix of registrants, people mm -hmm. who are connected to you through social media, people who are connected to Branch Ed through social yeah. media. Yeah, I put it out about uh, four times. <laughs> I That's said, hurry awesome. up, it's filling up. Thank that. you. Yeah. Yeah. But it's you know, really how we're are... growing our, our uh, universe of people who know that we have this free stuff workshop <laughs> yeah yeah that's what's yeah. good yeah mm -hmm. yeah gosh and there's just uh you know it's there's so much out there now i, I mean just uh it's great that I, that people are even showing up and then as we get as we get a little further in it will get a little bit more uh political and things like that too <laughs> are they doing kim Great, Anita's drawn one already with a with a termite in hand. She didn't need oh, those. a termite! Yay, cool. <laughs> so she's on it. She's now adding her color in. She didn't need the the images to draw off of. She was oh my she gosh, was, she was on it. Um, I think if we give them maybe two, like one one more minute, minute, and then we can pull them back in. And okay. then are we? Um, it seems like we'll share out. Um, There'll be a minute for sharing out, yeah. Yeah. Okay. If they can put the put it up there, like I. Did. Yeah, she did it, and it was super clear. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Send a message. She said, "This is the most relaxing lunch break." Where? <laughs> oh, good. It's. That's how I Great. feel too. One more minute. Okay. One more minute. Okay. Chris, is that um, the the cadence in which I'm moving the slides? Is that okay? It's Would perfect. You like yeah, it's, it works okay. for me. Yeah, we're we're you know we're already at forty minutes, so like yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you. Jennifer, you want to pull him back in? Yep. Okay. All right. I think uh, I think that Jennifer has pulled uh, most of you back in, and um, this is an opportunity, Clarence. Uh, can, can you hold your one of your can you hold yours up for us <laughs> yeah, whatever you got that beautiful clouds right behind you man and i'm just talking about clouds and look at them mm. right you put, oh, hold it right is. in front of your face where your face is okay let's see oh my gosh it's yeah oh shucks ah there it is there it is hey that's pretty doggone good you got it. All right. I see it. Yeah. If, if I was um, like three years old, I think it would be, you know, not bad. No, not bad at all. Yeah. <laughs> what about uh, Lisa or anybody else that has one? Somebody had one with a, with a termite. <laughs> Who is that? Was that you, Lisa? You had a termite in there? No, we were a scorpion. Okay. You're just a scorpion. Who, anybody else have one? Yeah, yeah, that, I was telling them. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Kim, Kim, Kim's giving away all my secrets. I'm the one with yes. the termite. Uh, yeah. So I was painting see. my termite. I was drawing my termite in, and um, in the neck, in the in the in about two or three rooms before, I went and added a spider. I went and added a centipede, and the termite that was being devoured actually is uh, followed by its whole whole termite family because termites live in a family, and so they're yes. all worried about the one termite being devoured by the scorpion. And so I'm going to pull up my picture if I have screen sharing. Okay. Um, oh my gosh. Go. 
So look at oh my gosh, you got all the look at that nice yeah. Nice. So so that's that's Scorpy here. Uh, yeah, that's Scorpy. And that's the termite. That's the termite family who's very worried and screaming and trying to make a lot of noise. I will save our save our big brother and so on and so <laughs> forth. And there's a centipede coming out to check oh out what's happening. God. And the spider is in hot pursuit, and everybody's waiting to be devoured by. Absolutely, uh, you could get a, and you could bring in a wasp there too. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Wow, that's great. I did warn Kim, you never know what I'm going to come come back. Well, you never know because that's stuff. creativity and and who would have thunk uh, that you'd have all of that that you'd create that kind of thing. And so, you know, just imagine if you were talking with children about this and you talked about all the foods they ate and and they they could do something like that as well and then talk about, you know, their habitat and, you know, how important that is that they that they um that they 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 eat each other because that's part of their world. And then what do termites eat? And then what do the scorpions eat? And what do wasps eat? And what you know all of that stuff. And so uh, that that's really cool. I really enjoyed that a lot. Thank you. Thank you. That was really awesome. All righty, all righty. Anybody else have one to share? I think Marlene was holding up one. Luis. Marlene? Yeah. Let's see what Marlene's is. Oh, that. Let me see. Whoa. Now that is a, let me see, one, two, three, four. Yeah, you got a good scorpion there. You got a good scorpion, Marlene. That's good. Now I know Marlene has two boys and I wonder if those boys could, you think, do you think they've ever drawn a scorpion before, Marlene? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, all right, well, let's, let's go ahead and uh, move on and uh, we'll, we'll have a chance to draw some other things as well. Um, this next one, uh, uh, this next one is really uh, a tough one. So, um, one of the ways that uh, you know we we had a we had an expression in class the other day, and I was working with English learners and stuff, and the expression was, uh, "This kid is head over heels over Selena," and like, and and the kids go, "What's head over heels?" And you know, everybody knows here knows what head over heels is right but that means that you're kind of goofy you're really like excited about um uh this this person here um but it, it would be hard to draw head over heels i guess you maybe have a person going backwards or something like that head over the heels i don't know clarence is something like that head over heels what do you think i would not even know how to describe that yeah, it's a tough one. That's a really tough one. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do some of those things uh, as we go here. So this, uh, you know, to, to, it, suppose that we're talking about hyperbole and, and then we're using expressions. Again, a lot of uh, kids who are English learners, uh, these expressions are really difficult for them. And so um, you, you can see that they're hyperbole. He was so thirsty that he drank the whole river. Well, I mean, that means that he's very, very thirsty. And then you, how do you, how would you draw that out? So here I just did a quick drawing on a, on a iPad kind of a thing to see that. And um, what we'll do next then is I've got a list of hyperboles um, and you get to pick one of these. So uh, I, I, I've done this one before. These shoes are killing my feet. Um, you know, how would you do that? I'm so hungry, I can eat a horse. These are expressions that are used in English. Lourdes ran so fast, she left skid marks on the sidewalk. When I got my COVID shot, the needle was this big. Um, so I guess you could uh, maybe have something there. I would climb a mountain for an ice chocolate ice cream. And her smile is a mile wide, a mile wide. Holy cow, that's big. And Miguel is as skinny as a toothpick. So, you know, these are, these are things. So maybe pick one of these um, and sketch it out for us in your groups again, and you can share in your groups. And then uh, we'll come back and we'll see how some of you do uh, as you get these here. These are, these are a little bit harder than just doing a regular because you have to be really creative. So when I got my COVID shot, the needle was this big. I mean, I kind of thought about that, but it really was only like this big. But, you know, when you think about it, uh, it could be, you know, for some, some people, it could be really, really huge. And so 
um, uh, think about that as hyperbole. That means that it, you're, you're exaggerating to, to uh, an incredible extent, okay? So we'll take a few minutes to do that. Before you get in your breakout rooms, if you can just jot down the one you're going to try out in your drawing, um, this would be, this would be because yeah. you won't be able to see the slide once you get to your breakout rooms. Yeah, pick, yeah, pick one of these. And uh, oh, I, I really like the one my, my, these shoes are killing my feet. Uh, I can see, you know, daggers and things like <laughs> and blood, but uh, we'll see. And our, our uh, what we'll have to do is based upon your drawing, will we be able to get these? Okay, so Clarence, you got a big one there. Lisa, go ahead. And the rest of you, let's see here, Marlene, Anita, Beatriz, okay, uh, and whoever else is on there, Adriana. Uh, go ahead, Adri. Okay. Let's see what you do. We'll see what they do. Let's see, it's 46. Well, our time's going really well. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Feet are, I want to draw. My feet are killing me. See. I just set the timer for five minutes. Okay. Sort of trying to draw Mike Miguel as a toothpick with those ruffles on the top. You know those toothpicks in sandwiches. <laughs> Jennifer, I'm gonna pause it. Did you do one? Everyone should be coming back. We have about 46 minutes until the breakout. Anita, do, do, do you have one to let's see if we can guess what it is? Okay, let's see. Oh, that thing there. Okay. Oh. Uh, oh, skinny is a toothpick. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Skinny is a toothpick. And oh, that one. See that? That's that's what I had in visualized in my mind. Uh, that's what I had in visualized in my mind. I would climb up for an ice cream. Absolutely. Good. Good job there, Lisa. Do you have some? One. What is it? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, my, your smile is a mile wide. I forgot that one. Yeah, mile wide. Clarence, what did you? Which one did you do? The hard one. I'm sorry. I was trying to unmute. Um, no, I'm trying to learn how to do it on my phone. Oh uh, my Lisa's, gosh, that's Lisa's is that's so even much harder. nicer. I couldn't get mine to work too well on the iPad. I couldn't. Well, I couldn't show it on the iPad, but I did a mile wide smile. Oh my! Wow. I did. Uh, let me see. I did. Uh, how do I do this now? Can you can you all see that one? No, I think you need to to the center of the computer. Oh, I got to go like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, schnitzel. Oh, I got to do this. Ah, I'm not, I, I'm using my uh, my. Well, it's supposed to be a foot with uh There it is. A foot with a couple of daggers in it. Because uh, that's what my feet feel uh, most of the day. Uh, my feet are killing me. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear gosh. And those those kind of things are, are, are fun to do. And, and also, these are body parts. And uh, these are, um, you know, when you have like climbing up, a, you know, I'd climb a mountain. You, you've got, you know, all of that stuff in there. So it has a lot of language. And what it does is that it, it keeps because it's drawn and it's talked about and it's shared, um, these are expressions then that kids can pick up, especially for if they're language learners. Uh, this is a really good way to get those kinds of things. And, and it also teaches them that, that idea about hyperbole, uh, but in, in a very, very, you know, uh, specific way. I mean, there are a lot of ways to do hyperbole, uh, but um, this is just one way that uh, shows up in expressions. 
So that's really fun to do, and I appreciate all that. Um, let's go on to the to the next one here, if we can. Oh, this is a really fun one. Okay, now this one, um, and this the reason I've I've got this one here right at this point in the in the uh, workshop is that. Um, because uh, because I work with a lot of bilingual communities and immigrant communities from all over the world, but uh, mainly here in Laredo, it's uh, they're from from uh, northern Mexico, or some come all the way from central Mexico and come through here. Is that understanding that um, also the idea that you know uh, we can create things that uh, we might not see in life, but we can create them in our in our uh, lives and that these help us understand how people can have lots of different ways of being and doing. So uh, one of the things that I've done for a while is uh, I've created this idea of a shark dial. So there's there's my shark dial, um, and then I have a seahorse butterfly. Um, and uh, I, this morning when I was preparing for this, I'd even thought I, I thought about this idea of a um, an elephant crocodile. So what I'd do is I would draw the elephant, sort of have elephant and then big elephant ears. I'd make it an African elephant with big ears and I'd have tusks. And then I'd have that the crocodile um, sort of nose coming down and little teeth coming out the side. And then I would create a crocodile um, elephant. And <clears throat> for me, what that does is really, this taps into <clears throat> how creative students can be uh, to, to come up with these ideas and then they can paint them and uh, use uh, uh, different kinds of colors. Um, and uh, it also helps them just just get a sense of, uh, you know, that we can make new things out of art, that we don't have to just copy. If I want to draw a picture of this uh, of this cup right here, um, I could, you know, holding a cup, I, I could have a flower coming out of the cup or I could have a, I could put a little... Uh, Scorpion climbing up the side of the club. I mean, anything that that you want to do, an artist can do. Um, and then you can make these things. Now, supposing you had a class where kids, uh, you know, all your children uh, came up with uh, two new animals and then gave them names like that. You could have those around the class and uh, things like that. I've done this in my classes before and and had my my college students uh develop these and boy, they just really had a wonderful time doing it. So on the, the next slide that you'll see, uh, I've given you a set of, uh, um, you know, animals that are listed below. Uh, 10 minutes is probably too much time. We can maybe take, you know, seven minutes or something, but <clears throat> be creative, focus on using your imagination over getting things right. Uh, so we've got here a giraffe turtle, um, a giraffe turtle, hmm, what that might be, an elephant bunny, uh, yeah, an elephant bunny, uh, might have some bunny ears, I'm not sure, or the bunny might have uh, an elephant tusk, I'm not sure, uh, a crab apple, not a crab apple, but a crab apple, an apple that's a crab, a kitty pear, a whale snake, ooh, that's a that's a hard one. A grasshopper dog, and a tiger pig. So pick one of those and see what you can come up with. I'm going to go ahead and work on one as well. I've got my paper right here. I think I'll do. I'm going to pick one of these. Uh, I'm going to. I think I'm going to do a grasshopper dog. So I'll try that here. A grasshopper dog, and we'll. We'll get going here. Let's see, grasshopper dog. Hmm. 
Ooh, cool. Well, I like it. I like it. Ooh, yeah, I see that works there. Ah, uh, no, I gotta go like this. Oh, it's too, it's too big. Yeah, too big, too big. But you can see the grasshopper dog. Oh, I've got it. I don't know how these things work. There's a grasshopper dog right there. Cool. I like my grasshopper dog. That's really nice. A tiger pig. Oh. oh, I do not follow the rules in the slide. Oh, you don't? Oh, that's all right, Anita. <laughs> that's all right. Look at I see I, I see him going. Uh, let me see. Marlene is going. Beatrice. Oh, there's Adri. Did you are you drawing a what are you drawing, Adri? What do you got? That's a, a butterfly seal? No, the bunny elephant. Bunny elephant. Oh, got you. And That's a bunny elephant. And I didn't show you my my kids. My my shoes are killing me. This was oh, my, that was killing your was feet. My, oh, you got with the poison. poison. <laughs> wow, that is even better. And I like that you put a little face on there. That's very creative, Adi. Very creative. That's awesome. Good for you. I. Who would have thought? I, I mean, poison, I, I, you know, that's pretty good, poison on your feet. And I don't know if you can see this guy here, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 I don't know why yours are coming out so nice, but mine is uh, there. I think I have it too big, but there's part of it, and then there's the puppy dog. So I'm, I probably should have made it smaller. But that's a, that's a, a puppy. It was a puppy grasshopper? Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Wow, I, I didn't know that you could do that kind of artwork. Yeah. That's pretty doggone good. Oh, uh, well, you're doing an ac Axolo bunny? Can you see it? Let me see. Let me see here. Let's see. what. Where, where are you, Marlene? Uh, that's a – go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that is cool. Very cool. Man, way to go. That is really good. Luisa, do you have yours? What is it? That's a, a, a duck. Oh, giraffe. That's something of a giraffe. Yeah. Turtle giraffe. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's a turtle giraffe. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. And and let's see, uh, Clarence. What? Oh, oh, you have yours. What's yours? Let's see. It's uh. Let's see if we can see it. <laughs> Will it work? Man, that was, I, I like that. Yeah. This has been enlightening and enjoyable. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Prophet, can I, can I share something? Are you sure? Absolutely. Oh, I wanted to, I, I wanted to share something I used to do in my classroom and I think it applies to this um, activity a lot. So, um, when students have their drawing, like here, uh -huh. I would have them fold it like this uh -huh. and create these two little windows that uh -huh. show a little bit of the animal. And, and let then them they, guess? Would have to create, they would have to create an, an adivinanza, so a riddle. So a they riddle. would write the riddle here and then show the little like clues 
and then they oh, would open it up. That's a very her. good one. That's Just, a very good one. Thank you for that. And Lisa, yours was in color, right? Pardon me? Lisa's was in color. Yeah, Lisa. Uh, Lisa's was in color. Yeah, I think so. It's yeah. a crabby apple. Yeah, that's a crabby apple. That is definitely a crabby apple. That's a good one. And again, I like that idea if, to, to make a riddle. Again, that's playing with language, which is creativity. And then you have the creative art. So that's really good. Um, and yeah, all kinds of fun things there. Yeah. So why are these dual images <clears throat> important? Um, you know, each one of you ha will, will have an answer to that. But, you know, I think it promotes the idea of diversity in society and, and among people. You know, we're, we're all different. We, you know, there, there could be, we can imagine all kinds of things and we do it to encourage their imaginations and how they do things. I like that, you know, you have the clues and you can have riddles and it supports dynamic bilingualism and biliteracy. So you can have kids explain this in both Spanish and English. Maybe they can write about this. Uh, they could figure out, well, how would you say, you know, uh, a, a dog grasshopper, you know, a, a puppy grasshopper, you know, in, in Spanish, if you were to do that, or, or these other kinds of things, you know, uh, a tortuga, they, 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 que es un, uh, tortuga camello or tortuga jirafa, you know, all of those things. And so th those, are, those are really important things because they really express uh, imaginations and, and, it, and it can support bilingualism and biliteracy. Here's, here's one that I did. Uh, this is an actual, a, a painting. Um, and uh, do you know what that MD stands for, Adri? Anybody want to guess? That's Mickey Duck. Mickey Duck. So, you know, uh, I, I took, there's, there's Mickey Mouse. See, I guess if you take off the this, and then there's a, uh, uh, Oh, shared a file. Okay, she shared a file. Cool. Uh, Mickey Duck. And oh, cool. Axel Bunny. Oh, look at that one. Oh, and the, that is a kitty. Uralik. Okay. <laughs> and then I'm doing Axel Bullet. Yeah. And then th there it is right there. Oh, that's beautiful. Wow. That is amazing. This one, this is a painting I did a, a, quite a while ago when I was first working on this idea of, you know, having two things together. And here's the Mickey Mouse over here in the corner, but this is Mickey Duck. And, you know, I just thought, well, it's, it's just kind of cool because, you know, it's Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck. It, you know, it could be, it could be um, any of those. I love that. Thank you, Marlene. And then here's my, my famous uh, El Vicente. Um, and this is uh, El Vicente. And uh, so it's got aspects of this, you know, famous Mexican cantante singer, uh, Vicente Fernandez, and this famous U.S. Uh, Southern um, singer, uh, Elvis. And so you can see on the glasses up here, I've got the V, and I've got, this is the Elvis sideburns, and here's the Vicente mustache, and here's the Elvis uh, shirt, and here's the Vicente, you know, jacket and this and this hat. And you know, and and the, and the glasses. And I spend a lot of time because, again, this idea of El Vicente is to me, it, it, it a lot of people talk about translanguaging and they talk about bilingualism, dynamic bilingualism, that it's neither, it's not Spanish or English or Spanish. It's, 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 it's sort of like this painting that I tried to capture that is, it, he's not either Elvis or, or, or Vicente, He's both of them, and he's, you know, and, and so when we, when we, you know, move back and forth in our language with people, we, we're sometimes we're Elvis and sometimes we're Vicente, and sometimes we're Elvis and sometimes we're Vicente. And, and, and that's okay because uh, this is the way, the way we talk as bilingual individuals. So um, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, there's that one. Oh, there's Vicente. Yeah, there's Vicente. He was actually talking to us. So now... Um, what I'm going to do is to take a five minute uh, a bio break. Uh, I'm just going to uh, you can draw and, and, and if you have ideas uh, like like Adri shared, if she does something in her class, I think that's a really great idea. Um, Adriana, if, if you could write that down in, in the what you do, uh, if you could do that in the meeting chat, 
um, for everyone. I think that that way people can pick that up and I'll be back in just a couple of minutes. Okay. All right. Feel free to go off camera. We'll, we'll, um, All right. So I think people are hopefully back now. And, and uh, I think um, uh, Clarence was talking about this early on about the, you know, expressions, uh, uh, art as a way to express uh, feelings and emotions. And I know kids, uh, some teachers have even have little cards where they'll put how you're feeling because social emotional learning is so, it's, it's a big thing now and all that stuff. And so you know, you happy and you notice that happy that, that there's a smile and the eyebrows. What's important about this is to get the eyebrows that are rounded when people are happy. And when this little guy here is angry, the eyebrows are going to go up. And and the mouth is going to go down usually or, or like this kind of. like rrr, rrr. And then when you're surprised, the mouth is open and the, the eyebrows are also going to be round. And so. I did these uh, three drawings really quickly, um, but kids can do those as well. Um, and to talk about, you know, their own feelings and express their feelings. Um, it's, I think it's really important to do that. So uh, we can do that. I also have this one here as a, as a kid, um, you know, there, there's so many kids that were, have been separated at the border. And um, so I, I, I did this one and, you know, just to thinking about this and, uh, um, uh, yeah, we're going here. Here we are. And and I and I made it as a little weddo, as a little, uh, you know, a kid that you, you probably wouldn't think of. But, you know, um, just the idea of being separated um, uh, at the border to me is uh, has always been a, as troubling. And, and even even though I understand all the issues uh, at the border, um, uh, the idea that kids are separated from their parents is to me is really, really tough. And I just as a as a parent myself and a, and a grandparent. Uh, it would be really, really hard. And so I, I tried to work a lot here. I did a lot of work with shading and toting, uh, uh, tones and, and uh, things like that uh, to make it sort of dark and then light. And, uh, you know, and again, I, I made the hair. Uh, thank you, Clarence. I made the hair, uh, you know, again, sort of light. So these are these are it doesn't matter whose child this is. It's it's somebody's child. And. Uh, so that's important. And sometimes that we can talk about that because here in, here in Texas, in particular Laredo, um, for, for those of you who have been in this area, we're right on the river. It, we're, you know, it's a Rio Grande on this side. It's a Rio Bravo on that side. But it's still a Rio and people cross all the time. And, um, and, and they're not all, uh, you know, gangsters and, you know, cartels and all that stuff. They're, they're families and people who are looking for uh, asylum in this country. So uh, but but it's a it's a very very complex problem and just me as a as a as an individual as a scholar and a and a and a human I've always taken on these issues and tried to capture them in art in ways that hopefully can tap into uh, what what people um, understand because there here in Texas there are a lot of people who who frankly are are just anti-immigrant um, but there are there are also large numbers of communities and people who are who understand uh, uh, what what it's like for for the immigrants who come here and and have to suffer these uh, these very painful events of seeing their children uh, put into uh, you know uh, places this is another piece a couple of pieces I've done the, the one on the right is my mother's day um, painting um, it's from a it's from somebody's artwork and I took it and I put it in a painting and made it um, you know, uh, the mother and the daughter on Mother's Day. And because a lot of a lot of families are, um, you know, here, right here on the border, uh, you know, families can't see each other sometimes. And so uh, it, it's a really tough thing. And I spent a lot of time on this to try to get the hands right, the, the expressions right, the, the feeling. Um, and then on the left, I tried to make this into really, a, uh, if you look at that as a creative, create, creative, the mountains are not like mountains. They're like this, wow, this like dreamy place. Uh, and I made the, the border wall very low because people do go back and forth. And, I, and if you notice what's on the cap, well, it's Dallas Cowboys. Because a lot of uh, Dallas Cowboys have a lot of uh, friends and a lot of fans. 
uh, in Mexico and the U.S. And, you know, uh, and then the other guy, you can't see it, but it's the Chivas. And the Chivas are from Guadalajara and they're a big, they're a big uh, football team there, uh, soccer team, we call them. And, you know, and then there's a, the, the, the younger sister over there just, you know, gosh, I miss my mom and my family that, who are uh, in, in the States. And then I make the, the fence up here, you know, as, uh, as green and, and vibrant and things like that. Because um, families have been coming back and forth from Mexico for hundreds, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just difficult now that, that people can't do that. And so, um, uh, and, and so I try to, try to um, capture that as well. So those are those. And those things, I think, uh, are important to do if you're working in, in communities. Now, and, and my experience is with Mexico, but, you know, there, there are Kurdish people, uh, there are Arab, uh, Arabs that have had, uh, you know, from Syria, from, uh, from uh, Lebanon that have had all kinds of difficulties with, with the war, the, the, the proxy war between Russia and the United States, the Ukrainians, uh, Central Americans, uh, you know, uh, Haitians, you know, the, all of these people are, are experiencing things, you know, Nicaraguans, um, and, it's it's very difficult, and so I, I try to capture um, what I feel are you know empathy for how difficult it must be for for these families um, uh, to to ha be driven out of their country and and have no place to go and be dispossessed and then try to find a, a new home, and that's constantly what I try to get at and try to make that part of uh, what I talk about because that fits into a larger understanding of you know, how it is, how important, you know, biliteracy and, and bilingualism are here for all groups, but um, understanding that that most uh, schools and most uh, communities and uh, policies are English only. And so I try to constantly uh, talk about that. I also think that art is a wonderful way of scaffolding student understanding. And scaffolding is, um, uh, you know, is, is, it's a way to get students to understand things that are beyond them. But by doing art, they can tap into those. And so if we if we look at Vygotsky's work, you know, of working in that zone of proximal development, that art then can be something very complex. You can create things and then you can bring it to some learning objectives that you have. And so I think that's really important. It enables you to interpret student thinking. So I do a lot of work here based upon uh, some work done out of Michigan of, of eliciting and interpreting student thinking. So art, I, I use art in all my classes because it helps um, when students then have to interpret what they're doing and why, what it means to them and why they did it this way. Um, I can understand about what they're seeing uh, and that also helps them develop their language and their, and their ability to communicate ideas. And um, you know, you can make your own art to go along with presentations, to develop their language, to help them express words. Um, I try to have in, in all of my classes, always have a piece of art so that we can talk about that or that it frames what I'm going to talk about as we move along through the day. That that uh, what that does is sort of um, constantly uh, um, encourages students. I encourage students to use art, to do drawing, to um to see art around them uh, because it helps them understand their world uh, uh, more completely, I believe. And it's a way to draw on culturally responsive and culturally sustaining practices. You know, um, a lot of times we talk about this as, as choosing children's books or children's materials, but I think <clears throat> art, you know, we want to choose uh, culturally responsive art that goes along with Arabic speakers, Chinese speakers, Farsi, Somali, Spanish, Ukrainian, Vietnamese, Kurdish, uh, whatever, Persian, so that we, we can have different ways of, uh, of expressing art in, in all, uh, all our classrooms. For example, you know, uh, the, we go back to the scorpion, you know, the scorpion is, is, is a very important concept in uh, Islamic uh, history. Um, and certainly in, in Egypt, you know, the, the pharaoh, uh, you know, was represented by a scorpion. And so we can, if, the more we learn about these things, about things that are in Farsi or Chinese, then we can make sure to have those um, uh, uh, practices and those um, artifacts in our classroom to be culturally responsive and sustaining, not just have, uh, 
you know, I, I certainly appreciate the Van Gogh and all of the, the great artists and all the great art. I, I do that. Um, but I also like Frida Kahlo and, you know, um, and I like a lot of artists uh, um, here. I, you know, so there, there you know, there, there's a lot of uh, art that, that we can have in our classrooms, in our presentations that will um, enhance and, and uh, I think speak to people who want to see something um, that represents them and also that is, is more creative than just having things in written text. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, for scaffolding, you can see here, I grabbed these pictures here of this teacher working on a, a map here where kids are learning about a community and they, they learn places. These are very young children, but doing all kinds of artwork to, to, to paint their community. Here we have an expert come in uh, and talk to children here. Um, uh, and you can see this is a culturally diverse classroom and talking about things that will relate to them. And I also love this third one is that kids can do murals. I mean, <clears throat> there, I don't know if any of you have been in San Diego, Chicano Park. I mean, it's, it's got one of the most beautiful uh, murals. Uh, you know, there are murals in Denver. There are murals in, <clears throat> in, in Puebla. Uh, there are murals in Mexico City. There are murals in in, in San Francisco, uh, the, the uh, certain areas of town, they're just beautiful. And, you know, you can, you can present those to kids and then they can draw their own murals in their schools that are culturally relevant and things like that. Kids now that, who are so savvy with tech, they can make their own kinds of videos and things like that, that short videos that have artwork in it and, and that express artwork. Uh, I'm sure each of you have lots of ideas about this. Um, and so just because of our time, we, we can't get all of those. But my, my goodness, there's a lot of drawings and photographs. Kids can go around and photograph things in their neighborhood uh, that they find interesting. And then you can put those on the wall. Uh, we can develop drama where kids dress up and then maybe present something. And you have a background wall where they do art. So there, there are just a lot of ways to, that you can engage with art in the classroom. And what that does is just constantly ask them to be creative. Um, this is a piece that I did for a book. Uh, well, Peter, uh, this is the Plyler v. Doe 1982 case, where the case was that uh, in Texas, of course, lovely Texas, um, uh, Plyler, uh, the school district says that we do not have to uh, take children whose parents aren't um, documented. And so uh, the families took that to court. And this guy, Peter Ruse, who I've met, he's just a wonderful guy. Um, he took it to the Supreme Court and he argued against Plyler School District. And, um, and he won at the Supreme Court. And I know that our Governor Abbott here in, in, in Texas has said, we're going to go after Plyler B. Doe, but I don't, I don't think it will happen. Uh, public schools, it says that public schools must accept all children regardless of their immigration status of their parents. And they can't in any way intimidate or prevent parents from bringing their children to school or from picking them up to school. Because a lot of times you'd have the Border Patrol and stuff waiting out there. Uh, they can't do that either. This is a, it's something that children have the right to attend public school. And so I did this. This uh, you know, I got the, you know, I put a lot of symbolism in here that the Virgen Guadalupe, she's angry about this. Uh, you know, we've got the border wall. We've got this beautiful family here. We've got some families here that are like, wow, we don't want kids. You know, we've got cases in Texas where uh, this one case uh, where uh, the school held back Mexican Spanish speaking children for three years and allowed the, the English speaking children, white children to go ahead because they thought the Mexican children were holding back the development of the, the English speaking children. Those are, those are just injustices that, that are not, not fair. And so I, I did this one and it ended up on a, on a book cover because I do a lot of book covers and, 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 and uh, the book company was good enough and Peter Ruse was, uh, I, I actually gave him this uh, art piece that I did for him. So that's great. This one, uh, this next one here are, you know, uh, um, 
you know, is the board, you know, what is the border wall? And, you know, and President Trump said he was going to build the border wall and the border wall and we're going to stop all these people. Um, and the border wall, I tried to see, is the border, the border wall is a beautiful wall, um, but it's, you know, it has its ups and downs and uh, it's places where people pass and uh, immigrants um, uh, to this country will always uh, find ways to uh, uh, get around the wall. And so I tried to make it into something like this. So as a discussion piece, because I know a lot of people um, are opposed to the wall. We have uh, here in Laredo, a large group of people who are opposed to having a wall around Laredo. Um, and then there are other people who say, no, we need a wall and we need to keep people out. And here's the reason why. So to have those kinds of discussions, I think, are really important for a classroom. Um, and and it's, uh, the teacher's role is to to have students express their informed opinions about these things. And why do we do have these things? You know, because when I grew up a long time ago and I'm like de la tercera edad, como quien dice, I'm like the third age. Uh, uh, when I used to go to Mexico, there were no walls. I went to Mexico all the time, back and forth. I mean, I and I lived in Mexico for six years as a as a kid uh, and coming back. So, and then this other one here um, is a piece that I did because um, I don't know if you know this, but what California, uh, uh, Arizona did was it built the wall and then it 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 uh, it had certain areas where it would only allow immigrants to go through, but that was the hot, the hottest, most dangerous part of the desert. And so a lot of families died in the desert. And so, you know, I've got these names up here of, uh, you know, of, of people and, and I have this one Esperanza and I put that on there, Hope. And then, you know, this one from Oaxaca and this one from Morelia, cause I'd lived in those, those cities and stuff. Here we have the clouds again like the beautiful clouds behind uh, Clarence, uh, very similar to those. And then uh, I, I put little uh, visions there. They're looking through. We don't know if they're looking through the Mexican side to the U.S. side or they're looking in the U.S. side to the Mexican side because when you come here as an immigrant, you know, you have lots of opportunities, but you also give up lots of things. Um, and I really tried hard to to get that discussion going about how difficult it is uh, for uh, uh, the immigrant experiences for so many immigrants who come to this country, okay? Now, um, as we get toward the end of this, uh, I think it's really important for you to talk with your students about gallery walks. Um, and, you know, as students produce all of this art in your classroom and all the animals, let's say they do all of these uh, interesting animals like a, a crocodile elephant and a turtle giraffe. And what was a turtle? No, we had a, what was, what, what did she do? She did a turtle, pig, giraffe or something. I can, or, or, no, kitty. It was a kitty, turtle, pig. Um, you know, but let's say the kids do that and then you put that on the wall and you can have that in the, the hallways. Uh, you could have these things. Look at all these nice kitty cats that the kids did. Uh, look at, some, you know, if you think about the, these are young kids who are experimenting with color. And these are almost like Picasso-esque uh, because they're so abstract and beautiful. And uh, here's one with music. And, and this kitty cat has brown legs, but then has blue here. So they're doing all kinds of things. Here's a teacher that has a whole wall dedicated to student art. And then you can see that the, the student is explaining uh, what that art piece means to him or her. Uh, same thing here on this wall where you put up and you just have a line across there and you use, um, you know, just a regular old, um, uh, what are those things called? I know me acuerdo for putting up laundry. Uh, you know, you just put those up there and uh, pincers and, and, you know, and put the student's art up. That way you're celebrating students' arts just like you celebrate their, re you know, their written work. Uh, you can celebrate their artistic work in their classrooms. And uh, that's that's really important, I think, because it, it tells the world that we do art here. We are creative. We see things differently. I mean, I think that's the message that these kinds of uh, events have in schools. And so I think it's really, really wonderful that teachers actually do these kinds of things. And... Uh, 
Here, um, you know, culturally responsive, you, you have kids that draw themselves here and put themselves up here. You have it here. You have a young lady with a, you know, <clears throat> wearing a, a head, head scarf. Um, here you have this one, uh, kids from different countries. Uh, here's the, this is a, from a book cover where you have kids from different countries and speaking two languages. Here you have kids uh, that come from all parts of the world. Um, th that idea that you're, you have children in your classroom or students in your classroom that come and that you can celebrate um, that, that, um, that you have, you're lucky enough to have kids from with different kinds of cultural practices and cultural experiences. So I think that's really good. Uh, by the way, this little girl right here in the painting, that's my granddaughter, but I usually don't tell people that, but that's my granddaughter. Uh, I just put her in there like that. But you know, uh, this one is uh, was for a book cover. This one here is what a teacher did to make sure that all kids saw themselves as represented in class. And then here we have this beautiful thing where kids are sitting around and, and uh, this one has done really, really well, but coming around the world and, and really um, representing the students in your classroom um, and knowing that uh, that really makes a difference when students see themselves and feel themselves as being invited into the classroom. So I think that's what art can do as well. In the next section, we'll examine immigrant families and immigrant students as seen through art. So here, all children, regardless of their parents, have the right to attend school. We already saw that. Uh, many migrants are emergent bilinguals, they're English learners, so we have to offer support. That's our responsibility and duty. And art is a way to scaffold their learning because it communicates ideas of, and feelings that students may not be able to express in writing or in spoken form. So we'll just go through this next section uh, relatively quickly. This is a piece I did a long time ago, and uh, it's this was uh, happened in Arizona when uh, when they passed a, a, a law that said we can no longer uh, teach uh, uh, Spanish in our classrooms. And so um, the idea, and somebody said to me once, well, that's Hillary Clinton. And I said, no, that's not Hillary. <laughs> that's just a, a teacher. And, and some people say, well, is she saying stop uh, keeping the kids out or is she saying stop uh, the kids from coming in? So, and I, I put a lot, there's a lot in this, this uh, artwork here. Um, and, and I don't mean to say that all teachers because they're white or look like this are, are against immigration. This was just a, an, uh, an indication. It gets us uh, discussing, uh, you know, uh, how kids, uh, this is our America and it's for all children. Um, and so we want, and, and these children, uh, if you look down here, there's an English book here. Uh, you know, there's books here that this, these kids want to learn just like the kids that are in the classroom. And let's make sure that we have all the opportunities that they can do well in the classroom and be fully accepted in the classroom, right? Um, this one, uh, th this is a, a kid sitting here with, a, again, the sort of the border wall. And it says up here, me llamo Jorge. My name is Jorge. Hablo español, pero todo está en inglés. I speak Spanish, but everything's in English. Y por eso, and because of that, no puedo participar. I can't participate. Y no entiendo lo que trato de leer. And I don't understand what I try to read. So I'm frustrated. Um, and so here's a possible, you know, here's a picture of like, what we need to do, um, and here in Texas, uh, particularly we don't, as the kids get into the, the upper grades where this Jorge is, there are very little support for kids who need to learn English uh, in the middle and high school. Here they have, uh, they, they usually have pull out programs where they teach them English, but there's not a lot of preparation of secondary teachers to, to be ready to incorporate and include and encourage and expand uh, the languages of the kids that are in the upper grades. And so that's why I, I put that one in there. And we talk a lot about that in my course on teaching English learners uh, in schools. Now this one, I'm just gonna say, what does this mean to you? What's happening to this young boy? I'll give you a couple minutes. Just do a quick write. What's happening to this young boy?
this is one of my most intensive paintings that I've done. So this idea comes from the work of Gloria Ansaldúa, who was a woman who lived on the border and wrote a lot about um, her experiences growing up, but neither here nor there in Nepantla, uh, that in-betweenness. And she talked a lot about how she was treated in school, about her uh, learning of English. And she used the term deslenguado. Deslenguado means that you've taken my tongue away. And uh, more recently, uh, you know, Jeff, Jeff McSwan talked about this, about uh, non nons that kids are, don't have English or Spanish that we talk to them about. And then uh, a, a friend of mine at Stanford, uh, Jonathan Rosa, calls it languagelessness. Uh, that is that we take the, the language away from the kids. And so here is a pretty heavy duty paint of, of, of uh, some teachers painting this student's tongue white because they want him to only speak English. And to do that forcefully is, is very, very uh, strong, I think. And, uh, and it evokes, it, this should evoke a lot of feelings, whether you're opposed to English or you're opposed to Spanish or whatever, it, it can invoke a lot of, uh, of feelings. Um, and, and I tried to make it that the, the kid is, uh, is scared and, uh, you know, being treated, and he's a good kid, he's well-dressed, uh, but they're going to take his tongue and they're, they're going to, well, one of this thing, wash. Yeah, they're going to take his tongue away. So, um, uh, and I, I think we have a, well, we're getting close to our last minute. We, in a small group, maybe three ways that you can use art in your class or maybe a couple of ways to incorporate artwork into language arts, social studies or things like that. So maybe if you just take some time, uh, if, if, if we, uh, Jennifer, you could maybe put them in small groups and a uh, couple, two or three ways that you think you could use art in your classroom based upon what you've seen here or some other ideas um, and or what you've done already to share with somebody. And then we'll come back in about about five minutes or so, okay? Chris, I'm gonna go ahead and share the closing slide unless you wanna wrap anything up with, okay. is that okay? Go ahead. okay? Okay. So I think everybody's back now, and that's really good. Uh, I hope that you are, got some ideas from your colleagues uh, in your group and that you think about in, the, in the, the, the weeks and months to come ways to engage with uh, art uh, in your class. Um, remember, you, know, you, you yourself don't have to be an artist, um, uh, but your, your students can do art and you can do all kinds of art. I don't care if you draw. I love that one uh, where somebody was, had a stick figure going up the, the mountain or the, I'm, I'm as thin as, a, as thin as a toothpick. You know, Carlos was thin as a toothpick. Th those are also artistic ideas and, and you, you, should, you should do that. So uh, remember that I, the art is in the eye of the beholder, what we see and what we do. Um, and here, I, you know, I, I, here's kind of like, you probably, that might be Frida, but nah, it, may, it might not. Um, Frida Kahlo here, and because I don't think she was a lefty and I made her a lefty there, but um, uh, you know, just however she sees herself, um, however, however we see ourselves as artists, that's how we are. Um, and, you know, I, I really relate to this particular artwork that I did because um, when I pay, I, I don't see myself, you know, as, as this, this person here, because I, I, you know, I have all these other experiences in my life and, but this is who, who I am, but I can see myself and I can be myself and I can create myself in other ways. And I feel really good about that. And so I think that's that's what that does. And then this other one, I, I did this one when I was at the University of Guadalajara in 1415. I, you know, I uh, the seer that um, uh, 
you know, this, this young girl, this, uh, you know, she, she can see so many things. Um, and, you know, this is one only one, this, this, this is sort of insider knowledge. This is the only uh, art piece I've sold <laughs> to somebody who has really, really uh, wanted it. So I sold it. But, um, but this, you know, again, this is just a simple, a simple drawing of a young girl uh, with long hair uh, who's seen and, and, and seen all over. And this one over here is seeing herself as, as this person here. So art is like that. We can do all kinds of things. Each one of you can, can draw, paint, color, uh, create, uh, you know, all kinds of things and, and engage your students in that. And you will see, I'm, I'm pretty certain of it, that it will expand uh, their understanding of the world and have a, uh, see it, the world, uh, the beauty in the world. Uh, just like we see some of the things that I saw of the, of the child, you know, that's been separated from mom. That's a that's a tragic kind of thing. Um, but, you know, we try to express that and be hopeful about that. So that's what art can do. And I'm really hoping that that as you come away from this, uh, um, you know, you, you learn something and that you'll do this. Uh, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. Thank you. And may the art be with you. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, um, so the, now I'll, I'm going to turn it over to Kim and uh, I'm going to leave right now because I have to go to an, a, yet another meeting. It was just such an honor to be able to 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 be able to meet and, and uh, talk. Thank you, Lisa, for coming to this and all of those and Adri and Marlene and Luisa, all of the folks and, and Clarence that, that, for coming. And I wish you well and, and, and may the art be with you and, and do lots of things with art in your life. Thank you very much. Bye, Chris, name. thank you oh. so much. We just okay. really appreciate it. I see okay. all the hands. Thank you. Up. Hope to see you soon. Andale. Bye-bye. Um, Y'all, we're going to hop off in just a moment. I would just love, this is a very quick survey from for the workshop from today. We would love your feedback. The QR code is here on the screen if you want to do it, if you have a phone um, and you're able to get that. Um, uh, we would just love your feedback. It helps us to inform future workshops. Um, and tells us what you enjoy from our workshops and what you'd love to see in the future. Um, Jennifer also has it, um, the link to it, which she'll put in the chat in a moment um, if you would like to, if you don't have a phone um, and would like the URL link. I'll also send a follow-up email with this survey. So, but if you are able to do it right now, usually we find if you do it right now, then we'll, we'll be able to get it done. Um, as you're doing that, just a couple of upcoming things that are happening. Um, on April 26th and 27th, so coming up soon, is our MRS workshop. Um, and that's our mixed reality simulation. It's a two-day workshop. Um, and we are super excited about this workshop to be able to show you more of the MRS lab. Um, you'll have folks, uh, faculty who are using MRS in their classrooms um, and hear about their experiences with their teacher candidates and how it's impacting their work. Um, and you'll also get a free 10-day um, uh, uh, trial run. And so you'll be able to try it out yourself. So I definitely highly recommend um, coming and seeing about the mixed reality simulation um, and seeing what it's all about. Uh, we are thrilled to be able to share um, that with our branch and core community. Um, so the flyer is, oops, here. Um, there's also a QR code. Again, um, it's coming up um, in a couple of weeks and it's from 12 to two. Um, last thing I want to note is that we do have a certificate of completion for um, this workshop. You will receive that certificate in the next couple of days in your inbox. Um, and so you'll have that to share um, that you that to show uh, that you were here and were able to participate um, in this workshop. Um, thank you so much. I'll put the QR code for the feedback if you if you still need to get that um, and give feedback. Otherwise, um, I'll give you eight minutes back, seven minutes back. Um, so maybe you have to prepare for your next meeting or you can take a nice walk outside or maybe even draw another piece of art. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our MRS workshop um, coming up later at the end of this month. Have a great day, y'all. Thank you.